All right. Uh, those of you who are new to our church, uh, we are going through the book of James on Sunday morning. And James, a big thing or big idea is a living faith. It's a living faith. That the gospel of Jesus Christ does not just remain in our head, but the gospel of Jesus Christ is being lived out actively, faithfully in our daily lives. And last few weeks, uh, James taught us about two different wisdoms. One, godly wisdom. Another one is worldly wisdom. And James said that godly wisdom is pure, peaceful, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. On the other hand, the worldly wisdom is driven by bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, and it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. And it is crystal clear that we as Christians, that we are to follow godly wisdom. But to do that, we need to humble ourselves before God. So in order to follow godly wisdom, we need humility. Because without humility, we'll never feel the need to depend on God. Many people will think that, you know what? I'm strong enough, I'm young enough, I'm smart enough, and I can live my own life. I do not need to depend on my God. If you're driven by your pride, you'll for sure follow the worldly wisdom. And once again, if you are prideful, if you're arrogant, you don't feel the need to depend on God thinking that you can run your own life with your own strength. And we know most people today, most of people today, that they're doing their best to control their life and their destiny. And this kind of life is really described well in Psalms today. You know what, I've really practiced hard, but as you guys know, I'm a terrible singer. Let's see if you know this song. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I practice so much. So Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. How many of you guys know the song? Only a few of you? Okay, here's a big generation gap here. Okay, so 1959 songs, okay? Uh, let me try. And now... <laughs> woo, the end is here. And so I face. No, I don't know how to do So he put the songs like this, okay? And now the end is near. And so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I have lived a life that's full. I travel each and every highway. And more, much more than this. I did it my way. Regrets I've had few, but then again, too few to mention. I did what I had to do and saw it through without exemption. I planned each charted course, each careful step along the highway, and more, much more than this. I did it my way. Yes, there were times I'm sure you knew when I bit off more than I could chew, and through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up and spit it out. I faced it all and I stood tall and did it my way. <laughs> I loved, I laughed, and I cried. I have, I have had my fill, my share of losing, and now as tears subside, I find it all so amusing to think I did all that. And, listen, and may I say, not in a shy way, oh no, oh no. Not me. I did it my way. For what is a man, what is he God? If not himself, that he has not to say the things he truly feels, and not the words of one who kneels. The record show I took the blow and did it my way. Yes, it was my way. You know, people who are singing this song, people who are listening to this song, I mean, it's a beautiful song. I mean, I think it can even say it's a gospel of human beings. But it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the pride of a man who feels he can handle the life with his own strength. I mean, once again, think about the lyrics. There was 
ups and downs in my life, he said. There were tough times. <coughs> sometimes I laughed and sometimes I cried. But I made it and I did it my way. People in this world might applaud for this kind of life. This guy might even be viewed as a hero. Many thousands of men and women sing this song when they're down and try to stand up to face another challenges. Once again, but the bottom line is, of this song is that I did it my way. Full of pride, arrogance. And another song that comes to my mind is My Life. Do you guys know the song My Life by Billy Joel? It says, I don't need you to <clears throat> I don't need you to worry for me because I'm alright. I don't want you to tell me it's time to come home. I don't care what you say anymore. This is my life. Go ahead with your own life. Leave me alone. I mean, we all love to sing these kind of songs. Thinking that we can live by ourselves. I don't need you. Don't tell me what to do. I'm all independent. I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm smart. I can do it my way. But for sure, this is not how God wants Christians to live. Now, if we are prideful and follow the worldly wisdom, James says, James says in today's passage that we will fall into traps of sinning with our tongues and being arrogant with our lives. If you follow the worldly wisdom, you will have an arrogant tongue and you will have an arrogant life. So let's take a look one by one. Let's look at verse 11. James says, if we're prideful with our tongues, we will criticize and judge others, people, other people very easily. Verse 11 says, do not speak evil. Or NIV says, we're reading from English, uh, ESV, but if you read from NIV, it says slander. Do not speak evil against one another. The one who speaks against the brother or judges his brother, judges his brother, speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a door of the law, but a judge. Now last week's message, last week's passage, James chapter 5, chapter 4, verse 5 to 10, it was about humility. It was about humility that we need to have to develop friendship with God. Not with the world. We need humility to develop friendship with our God. And when we have been humble before God, we will be able to control our tongues. But if we are prideful, arrogant, and follow the worldly wisdom, we will use our tongues in a way that does not glorify God. So to speak evil against one another, or slander means to make false charges in order to damage a person's reputation. To speak evil against one another means to make false charges in order to damage a person's reputation. But the term as used here is broader than that. We may speak the truth about a person and still be unkind. Or we may spread gossip that others have no business let me ask a very simple question. What is gossip? We always do that, right? No? No? Only me? Sorry. <laughs> this is the Rick Warren, the okay, Pastor Rick Warren's definition of gossip. This is what it says. When we are talking about a situation with somebody who is neither part of the problem or part of the solution, then we are probably gossiping. Did you get that? When we're talking about a situation with somebody who is neither part of the problem or part of the solution, then we are probably gossiping. And this is what theologian Daniel Doriani said about the gossip. He says, to gossip is to take a true story where it should not come. Right? To gossip is to take a true story. Yes, you're you're, you're, you are delivering a true story, but that's not where you should go. That's gossip. And it's that to slander is to create and spread false stories. 
you know, slander, gossip, criticism, these, these are all worldly speech. And they kill each other. And they kill community. It is self-centered rather than God-centered. And also, when we are prideful, we tend to judge other people. When we are prideful, when we are arrogant, we love to judge others. But do you know why we judge others? Let's look at Romans chapter 2, verse 3. It says, Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge, those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Once again, do you know why we judge others? Paul says that one of the reasons we tend to judge other people are to excuse our own fault. We think by pointing our fingers at somebody else that God is going to forget what we have done. Or when we point out how somebody else has fallen, we don't look so bad. So when we judge other people, that, that judgment makes us look holy. Oh, that person, you know what, he did that. By pointing our finger, that judgment makes me look better. People are going to think, oh, maybe Pastor Dave doesn't do that. And when I criticize other scholars, I'm making my judgment make me more smart than the scholars. If I'm criticizing on the scholars, like view, you, you know, I don't agree with that person, and I judge that person's view, that, that action makes me look smarter than other people. Once again, you know, we think by pointing our fingers at somebody else, we tend to think that, you know, I'm holy and I'm holier than you. And we use it an excuse to blame others. We love to accuse others and excuse ourselves. But how do we do that? Well, how do we excuse ourselves? You know, we do that by relabeling them. We are coming up with a different terminology. It's like this. I'm not a gossip. I'm just sharing a concern. We say, I'm not a gossip. I'm just sharing a prayer request. We say, I'm not lazy, I'm just mellow. I'm not negative, I'm just being realistic. I'm not unreliable, I am flexible. I'm not critical, I'm just being discerning. You know, we just change the term the way we want to use. But the bottom line is that we are judging other people. But we as Christians, we should not judge others. Why? Because that is unloving and because that is very, very sinful. We should not judge other people because that is unloving and because that is very sinful. Let's read a verse one, uh, verse 11 one more time. James 4, 11. He said, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against the brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and the judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. See, when you speak or judge other brothers, you're speaking against the law. James says, when you speak against one another or when you judge other brothers, you are speaking against the law. And what law is James talking about here? And what does that mean that, that you are speaking against the law? Well, let's look at James chapter 2 verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law, the king's law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. And throughout the letter, James has been talking about loving each other. James says, if you have genuinely accepted Christ, then you must have love in your heart, and that must overflow to other people. You must love each other. Not just verbally, but practically, you need to reach out to people who are in, who are in need. So James, that's what James has been talking about, loving each other. And what law is to love each other? Once again, it is the royal law, it's the king's law. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But when you speak against, and when you 
judge others. Definitely, you are placing yourself above other people as if you are superior, and you're not loving that person, and you're not keeping the royal law. So, in other words, you are breaking the law. you're breaking the royal law, and this is a very, very serious sin. But because we're so used to gossip and judging others, we don't tend to think it's a serious sin. But just as we have seen from the scripture, if you do not love each other, if you speak against one another, if you judge one another, it is a very, very serious sin. Actually, what is the, sec what is the greatest commandment that God has given us? Love your God with all your heart. And what's the second greatest commandment? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But when we do not love our neighbors, when we speak against each other, when we judge each other, it is a very, very serious sin. If we are prideful and follow the world of wisdom, we will have arrogant tongues. Speaking evil and judging others. And secondly, if we are prideful and follow the worldly wisdom, we will be very, very arrogant to the point that we think we can control our lives and our destiny. If we are prideful, we will become very arrogant to the point that we think we can control our lives and our destiny. So the next, passage, our next uh, verse, James coming up with a hypothetical situation here. And in chapter 5, actually next chapter, um, James condemns an evil and wicked rich people. But in today's passage, James is exhorting the businessmen to change their attitude. And what is wrong with their attitude? Well, they are very prideful and they are very arrogant. Let's read uh, verse 13. It says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year, and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time, and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Now, boast. Here is presumptuous bragging about their plans, rather than humble submission of those plans to God, who alone can determine what tomorrow holds. Once again, listen to what they say. Okay, verse 13. Come now, you say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Very prideful, very arrogant. See, this one theologian uh, said this. James says, such speech is presumptuous and arrogant in several ways. Number one, it presumes that we will live as long as we please. And this guy, he presumes that, that he will live as long as he please. Number two, it presumes we can make whatever plans we please. And we can go today or tomorrow. The choice is ours. Number three, it presumes we have the capacity to execute whatever plan we conceive. We declare that we will make a profit. This guy who said, what did you say in, in verse 13? He thinks he can do whatever he wants to do. He's very prideful and he's very and this businessman remind me of a man who compiled the Gospel of Luke. Let's look at Luke chapter 12, verse 13 to 21. And we're reading from New Living Translation. It says, Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our fathers to stay with me. Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, Beware. Guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told him a story. A rich man had a firm farm 
that produce fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, ah, I know. I'll tear down my barn and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you work for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Amen. This rich man thinks he can do whatever he wants to do. He's a smart man. He made a lot of money. He made a lot of crops. And he got no room to store all these this crops. And he thinks he determines the number of days. He said, store away for years to come. You know, I'm rich, I'm young, I have many years to live, so I'm going to enjoy my life. He thinks he determines the number of days and how much he can make and how much he can enjoy his life. God says a person who relies on himself is a fool. God says a person who is arrogant. Well, in this world, people might say, oh, you're very smart. But God says, if you are being arrogant, you are a fool. There's a little a story. It's about a woodpecker. This one, one woodpecker, he landed on a tree and began frenetically pecking away. Suddenly, a storm came up and both of lightning struck the tree, splitting this humongous tree in half and knocking down the woodpecker to the ground. Dazed momentarily, and he picked himself up. He flew away and came back moments later with several friends in tow. And he said to his friend, Hey, guy, there it is, boys. He prayed. I did it all by myself. Mm. Really? The woodpecker did that? But are we any different? Everything that we have, that everything that we have achieved, it was by God's grace, but we think, I did it. My way. There are so many practical atheists. Have you heard the term practical atheist? They know the theology in their head, but practically and realistically, they live like atheists, as if God does not exist. In their head, they all know the theology because they've been to church all their life. They know all the stories of the Bible. But in their real life, they live as if God does not exist. Practical atheist. You know, if you do not let God involved in your planning, you are a fool, Bible says. If you do not let God control your life, no matter how successful you are right now, Bible says you are Let's look at Psalm 37, verse 10 to 13. I love this passage. Psalm 37, verse 10 to 13. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes teeth at him. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. Now, in this song, the wicked, the evil people were planning to get rid of the righteous people. But their plot, their plans will never work. Why? Because God will not let them, no matter how much they try. 
at their well-planned plots, the Lord laughs. You know, it's like me, you know, to my youngest daughter. You know, my youngest daughter, time to time, she tried to trick me. She tried to trick me. But it's so obvious. But she thinks it's going to work. So obvious, so I, I, I know what she's trying to do. But she thinks it's, it's working. And I said, oh, really? And she thinks it's working. And she gets so excited and she to treat me even more. At the end, what do I say? You fool? <laughs> no. I said, that's cute. And that's exactly what God is saying. I mean, God is not saying, you know, cute to wicked people. But God knows their plan. And God just laughs. Human's effort, your effort, my effort, our efforts of carrying out plan, no matter how detailedly planned, if it's not led by God, it is useless. If we are prideful and follow the worldly wisdom, we will be very arrogant to the point that we think we can control our lives and our destiny. But remember this. You must remember this. God has the last word about our lives and our destiny. God has the last word. Right now, some of us might be going well with our lives. But if God is not in your life, if you do not let God plan your life, remember, God has the last word about our lives and our destiny. God says those people who are judging, God said in verse 12, there is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? You're judging other people and you make, you make yourself so holy and you make yourself so, so smart in front of people. But God says, but who are you to judge your neighbor? How about those people who are planning, whose life is going so well? Everything's going so well. People say, wow, that person is so smart. He's a, such a successful businessman, whatever. But God says, what is your life? Verse 14. He says, God said, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Very scary statement. In this world, people say, well, he's a very powerful man. But God said, you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. God says, who are you to judge? And what is your life? We are nothing without God. Amen? Everybody, we are nothing without God. But don't, mis don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying, oh, you know what? A God has determined everything. So you know, I'm just going to just sit back and do nothing and see what God decides to do. No, that's not what James is saying here. Actually, if you read the book of James, there are so many commandments that come out, right? Do this and do that, do this and do that. If we don't have to do anything, then why would James give us so many commandments? Remember, James is talking about activity throughout this book. But he's talking about activity that is humbly dependent on the sovereign God of the universe. Every accomplishment and every activity, literally every breath, is acknowledging I'm alive and I'm working only by the sovereign grace of God. You need to have a mindset that says, God, I need your grace every single second of my life. And I am dependent on the will of you in every aspect. That's the mentality that, that we must have. That I need you. I need your guidance. I need you to walk with me, walk by me, step by step. 
this world tells us to live like we're going to be here forever, urging us to make our plans, acquire our possessions, and work to build our portfolio. But James says, James tells us to submit to God. Don't live like you are going to be here forever. Instead, live and plan and work like your life is so short and like you don't want to waste it on worldly things. Live like you want to spend your life humbly before the sovereignty of God and ultimately for the glory of God. Now, as you listen to the sermon, I know some of you might be thinking right now, and of course, Pastor Day, I know God is in full control of my life. And as I was preparing for this sermon this week, I was thinking to myself, I know God, you are in full control of my life. That's what I said. But I felt God was asking me this question. So? So? So you know that I'm in full control of your life. So what? You know in your head, God says, you know in your head, day, that I'm in full control of your life. But do you really, practically trust me with everything that's happening in your life? In our head, in my head, I know that God is in full control. But here, I'm in control. James chapter 4 verse 17 is the last verse of this, this passage. James says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. <coughs> so James just, with just the one set, he just nails it. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, you know what to do, but you don't do it, it's not a mistake, Bible said it is sin. David Platt said this, humble submission to God's will means humble obedience to God's will. And this is where James gives us needed pers perspective on sin. And he says this, we normally think of sin in terms of sins of commission. Sins of commission. Doing what God has said not to do. Right? Sins of commission. So God says, do not lie. So we don't lie. God said, don't do this, and we don't do that. So we obey God. So this is how we often think of sin, as not doing bad things, okay? not doing bad things. So we think that we obey God. But David play continues. But James reminds us that just as serious as lying or coveting or doing anything else that God has, God has said not to do are sins of omission. Not sins of commission, but sins of omission. That is, disregarding what God has said to do. Disregarding what God has said to do. This involves hearing the command of God to do something, such as the command to admit dependence on God when you make your business plan, and then choosing not to do. Did you get that? This involves hearing the command of God to do something, such as the command to admit dependence on God when you make your business plan, and then choosing not to do it. In our head, we know that we are to depend on God, but practically, we don't. Once again, we all know in our head that we are to trust God and let God lead our lives. But when we don't do that, the Bible says it is a sin. Let's humble ourselves before God that we will not speak against each other and judge other brothers and sisters. And let's humble ourselves before God that we will not be arrogant. Let's always remain in God's word dwell in God's word, living in God's word, and that whatever we do, that we will depend on God and ask God 
in prayer, in everything. Acknowledging that our lives are short and we cannot control our lives and that we will fully trust God's love, power, and His guidance. That's far ahead. This morning I talked about two things. Arrogant tongue and arrogant mind. When we are prideful and when we follow the worldly wisdom, we will become prideful. We will become arrogant. And that kind of life will be just manifested so obviously in the way that we speak, in the way we treat other people, and in the way that we plan for our lives. If you are planning without God, Please remember, if you are planning your life without God, you are being arrogant. And God says, it is very foolish. So whatever that you're planning to do right now, let's bring it before God. Let's pray to God. Let's discuss with God.